The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we're going to talk today about cyber resiliency. Uh, we'll get into it a little bit deeper, but the real question isn't necessarily how secure your business is. It really needs to be how resilient is your business to one of these attacks. Uh, my name is Mike DePalma. I'm the Senior Channel Development Manager for Data. We are a backup disaster recovery company based out of Norwalk, Connecticut. So about 40 miles east of Manhattan. Um, my role is, is really just to go around and do presentations like this, sit on panels. I've been fortunate enough to present recently with folks from the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, uh, some of the other uh, cybersecurity companies in the space that you've probably seen on cable news lately with all the stories out there. And so as we go through this, these are stories and stats that come directly from those experts. And it really is important to educate yourselves and, and all of the employees within your business so that you can ensure that if an attack occurred, you can be you're as cyber resilient as possible. Just very briefly about that, I mentioned we're a backup disaster recovery company. Um, been in business for 14 years now. Uh, we are over 2,000 employees worldwide. We've got 23 offices around the world, uh, and we have nine data centers that we manage ourselves, um, so we don't use any private clouds. We've got two here in the States, one in Allentown, Pennsylvania, one out in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'll get into the importance of that in a little bit, but the idea here is the data stays in the country in which it originates in, and there's that geo-redundancy that's key as well. So when we look at the, the ransomware specific, the ransomware epidemic that we're seeing right now, the problem is most of the time, the only stories that make the news are the large organizations, the municipalities, police departments, large hospitals. And that really leaves the small business community thinking one of two things. One, well, why are they gonna attack me, right? Whether What data do I have that's all that valuable? Or you throw your hands up and say, hey, what can I, what can I possibly do? If the US government can get attacked, what is it that I can possibly do? The thing is, when you go back and you do forensics on all of these attacks, you can always find a gap that was there that could have been filled and wasn't. And the criminals are very good at finding that and looking for any sort of vulnerability. So it's important to really approach this not as a product that you can go buy off the shelf. There's a lot of great vendors out there that do a lot of great things, but nobody's going to guarantee you that, that they're going to prevent every single attack that's not only happening right now, but the attacks are going to happen tomorrow. And so you really need to look at this as a multi-layered, real, really culture of security that needs to, to emanate throughout the entire organization. The reason I like the large stories, though, is because we get hard numbers. We find out that you know an insurance company down in Atlanta paid $40 million of ransomware, the largest payment we've ever seen. Um, we saw the, the recent attacks. Uh, that, that occurred with the pipeline or the Kaseya attack. And what we see is that with the, with the hard numbers, we really get to see what these impacts are. And when we look at examples like the city of Baltimore, right, they were hit back in, in 2019 and they were asked for what was essentially about $75,000 in ransom. Now that's not enough to break the bank of the city of Baltimore, right? Especially when we see these six, seven figure numbers being thrown around. But the stance from the government is don't pay these payments. Um, they, it emboldens these folks on a macro level, you know, puts a bigger bullseye on your back. And so they didn't pay the money. And oh, by the way, they always ask for the money in some form of cryptocurrency because they know that if they, they ask for money in an ACH payment or a credit card payment, there's a chance that that can get tracked back to them. With these cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, it's next to impossible to find out where that money is going once it leaves. So city of Baltimore doesn't pay. They go and remediate the problem. Again, huge, robust IT team. Um, you know, they can do this. And eventually they did get their systems all back up and running, but it took them weeks. And they then have to go and report what the actual impact was, right? Because they have to go back to, the, to the, uh, the finance team and say, hey, we need more money. And what happened was the actual impact to the city of Baltimore was $18 million. Now, this math is the math that the criminals want you to do. Pay me my $76,000 in ransom. Or, oh, go ahead and try to restore your data and come call me $18 million later. And, oh, by the way, that $75,000 ask, that's now $500,000 because we know you're in dire straits. And so, you know, I mentioned the government stance on this. And they've always said it publicly. If you could go watch them present, they talked about not paying it. But last year, they actually came out with an official statement, the Treasury Department, official advisory specific to ransomware. And within that statement, they actually said that by paying the ransom, you're at risk of violating the law. Now, it's not illegal to pay a ransom payment. 
Somebody came in my house and stole my dog. I could pay that ransom and that's not illegal. The reason why you're at risk of violating the law is because unfortunately the folks that are a lot of times behind these attacks, they're terrorist organizations. They are enemy nation states. So by paying that ransom, you can inadvertently be funding these terrorist organizations, which clearly is against the law. Now, the statement doesn't have a ton of teeth to it because remember, it's almost impossible to figure out exactly where these are going, although they're getting better at it. And so once it leaves, it's very hard, but it does show you the direction that the government is going in. They've got a ton of regulations out there. Uh, but the problem is a lot of these, these acts that have been passed, they don't help catch any of these guys. They don't help prevent any of the attacks. Really what they're doing is they're shifting the burden over to you. They're shifting the burden over to the business community, saying that if you get attacked, hopefully you survive and you keep your doors open. But after that attack, we're going to come knocking on your door. and We want to see, first of all, on the front end, that you did everything possible. You checked off all the boxes to make sure you did everything you can to protect your data, your client data, your employee data. And also, we're going to make sure that you didn't pay that ransom. And so it really falls on your lap to make sure these are all protected. Now, I mentioned one of the things that uh, the, one of the reasons why the government says not to, to pay the ransom is because it puts a bullseye on your back. Once you pay once or once they find out that they can get through once, they're going to keep attacking you until, the, you know, until it dries up and you can show them that you're protected. And we saw that with the city of Baltimore. Yes, they, they remediated all those issues. They got their systems up online. But they didn't do anything to prevent that next attack. And so what happened in the fall of last year during all the craziness of remote learning, anybody that's got kids knows what that's like, uh, the, the school system was hit. We actually saw a lot of attacks on school systems last year. We actually saw an attack up here in Connecticut in the city of Hartford. Their public school system was hit two days before the opening day back in September. And they couldn't get it remediated in time. They couldn't get any of the systems, obviously with the remote learning and everything, they weren't allowed to do it with that hybrid model. And they didn't send an alert out until 5.30 in the morning on opening day. So there were parents dropped, going to empty schools, trying to drop their kids off, uh, parents dropping their kids off at the bus stop. It's this chaos that it's creating. So again, you know, once you pay that ransom, don't think that the fight is over. Um, they will continue to attack you. And I think it's important to understand who are behind these attacks. It's not the guy in his basement anymore. There is a corporate structure to all of this. We saw that in the pipeline attack when they started digging into who was behind that. And you started hearing terms like ransomware as a service, um, something that sounded new, but it's something that folks like me in the IT industry have been preaching for five, six years now. We've known that this is the structure. And what that means really is the really bright folks on the criminal side, they're creating the variants. And essentially, they just sell them off. It's almost like a franchise program. You can go on the dark web right now and buy a ransomware virus. And I call that the sales team. They're the ones going out and doing these attacks. There's even at some point uh, a, a tech support system that says, oh, you don't have a Bitcoin account? Don't worry about it. We'll walk you right through how to find your exchange, get it funded, get us our money as quickly as possible so we can unencrypt your data. It's important to know there are buildings on Earth right now where there are folks sitting around the, the water cooler talking about Game of Thrones or the Euro Cup or whatever they're talking about. And when break time's over, they're going to go back and sit in their cubicle and just attack as many businesses as possible. They've got quotas like any other sales rep. And at the end of the day, they go and they punch out. They go home, have dinner with their families. It's like any other industry. I actually saw a, a presentation a couple of weeks back at a security conference where they said that cybercrime would actually be the ninth largest economy in the world, right? So you have the US, you've got China, uh, India, Russia, and then cybercrime would come in ninth place, uh, beating every other country out there. It is just a massive, massive epidemic that we're living through. Now, we did see an uh, uptick in insider threats. This only makes up a small percentage of these attacks, but I think it's important to note because we did see an uptick of folks maliciously internally um, doing these attacks because what we saw last year was obviously there was a lot of chaos, a lot of worry about where your next paycheck was coming from. And so there was a panic and we did see an uptick in that. I, I think that'll come back down. We don't see as much of that, but I think it's important to know that goes back to this culture of security you need to, uh, you need to have. And I'll get into some ways to, to really remediate some of that as well. You don't necessarily think of organized crime as being cyber criminals, but they are. It's no longer the Sopranos and, you know, the Goodfellas and all the rest. Wherever there's easy money to be made with little risk of getting caught, the organized crime is going to have their hands in that. And we see that here in the States. We see it in Russia, Europe, China, all over the world. 
And so understand that these are the type of folks we're up against. I mentioned the nation states. Look, we could put all the sanctions we want on these folks and they're going to find ways to get in and make money. And the other scary part about these folks is sometimes they don't even care whether you pay or not. Their goal to some extent is just to disrupt our economy. And so we really need to be vigilant about that. And then the last one is the Internet of Things. It's kind of a buzzword for the last several years, right? Everything is connected. This morning, first thing I did, I asked Alexa how hot it was going to be up here in, in Connecticut. Um, I'll give you a little homework assignment. It's a very interesting story. The largest or the most lucrative casino heist ever pulled happened a few years back on a casino out in Vegas. And this was not somebody sneaking through elevator shafts, wearing masks, all the rest. These folks found a vulnerability in the internet connected fish tank thermometer, those big fancy fish tanks we have in all those casinos. They were able to then infiltrate the, the systems and uh, extract all of the personal and financial information for all the high rollers that gamble at that casino. Information that's worth millions of dollars on the dark web. So again, understanding way, who has access to critical data, how that access is, is granted is extremely important. We do a, a ransomware specific study every year. We've been doing it for the last five years, specific to the, the small business community. Um, you know, we, there's a lot of great third party data about there, but we want our own data. This is the world that we live in. And what we've seen is the trends tend to be pretty similar year after year. We saw an uptick in the healthcare industry, attacks on those folks last year. Why? These guys are opportunistic. What industry had more pressure on it last year than the healthcare industry? Um, you know, I mentioned the school systems. We saw an uptick in that because there was so much pressure on the school systems. But I think the more important thing to note on this slide is that every single industry is vulnerable to these attacks. The, the real genius behind ransomware is that they no longer care what your data is. Your data doesn't have to be valuable on the dark web. All they know is the world we live in right now, you cannot operate without access to that critical data. So you'll pay to get it back. And they have a much higher success rate on the small business community of not only getting through, but actually getting folks to pay. Those folks sitting in the cubicles, you, 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 there's two different folks out there. Uh, you've got the home run hitters who are going to go after the $70 million payout, or there's going to be the singles hitters that know that they can attack thousands of businesses all over the world knowing that they're going to, again, have a higher success rate of getting through and knowing that businesses cannot absorb an $18 million hit like the city of Baltimore. And that's why they're so you know, more apt to pay. And the problem is only about 25% of these attacks are reported to authorities. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is that the FBI doesn't have the resources to go look into a $10,000 ransomware attack. They just don't. Really, they won't report the threshold, but it's probably anywhere between $100,000 and $250,000 before they really start doing some investigations. And so a lot of businesses owners say, well, what's the point of reporting it? If I don't have to legally for compliance reasons, I'm just going to try to handle it on my own. But the other reason, and I think more important reason is businesses do not want to make the front page of the paper because they were attacked by ransomware. They just don't. They don't want their clients knowing that. They don't want their competitors knowing that. And so they try to handle it as quickly as possible. And that's a problem, right? The way they're getting through doesn't need to change too much because they're so successful. It still is coming through mostly through phishing emails. And these are not the, the emails from your long lost uncle. These are when you hear the phrase social engineering or socially engineered spear phishing attacks. We all give so much information about ourselves, about our business right on the on the Internet. You can go to my LinkedIn profile right now and find out, OK, Mike went to Johns Hopkins, got his 20 year reunion coming up. Now, if I'm a criminal, I'm going to say, okay, I know he probably gets hammered with, with emails from his alumni association all the time. So I'm going to now create an email that looks like every other email they, that's landed in my inbox. And it's going to say, hey, Mike, click here on this little hyperlink for all the information you need uh, for your 20-year reunion festivities. And I'm going to click on it because you know, I want to catch up with everybody that I graduated with or whatever it might be. And if that doesn't work, they're going to go down the list and say, okay, Mike used to work here. Here's some of his clients that I know he works with. And they're going to catch me. They're going to try to catch me asleep on a Friday afternoon. I'm trying to clean up my inbox before a long weekend or something like that. And I'm going to be asleep at the wheel and I'm going to click on one of these things. And oh, by the way, the best time for them to attack is on a Friday afternoon. Because if somebody's not consistently monitoring your systems, that now has a whole weekend to migrate to every system that it can. And so it's very critical to understand that. Now, of the folks that we interviewed that were attacked, 60% of them had some form of anti-malware filtering in place. A lot of them had endpoint detection, um, antivirus, those type of things. 
doesn't mean you shouldn't have this. This needs to be part of your cybersecurity plan. But back to that idea of cyber resiliency, there's nothing out there that's going to be 100% foolproof. You could go back and watch uh, FBI Director Ray a couple months back. He had to testify in front of Congress about the attack on the, the, the U.S. government. He was being grilled on it, rightly so. But he was open in saying that there's, there's nobody that can look you straight in the eye and say that you are 100% protected, again, from uh, attacks that are happening now or happening down the road. And a lot of times that's because of user error. Um, the technology is great, but if somebody opens the door and lets them into the, the systems, whether it's maliciously or inadvertently, um, there's not much that they can do about it. So the question is, how quickly can you detect that one of these attacks got through? And then how resilient are you? How quickly can you not just get your data back, but really get back into a production environment so everybody has access to all the systems that they need? And I think that's critical to understand. Um, when we look at the actual impact, it's the loss of productivity. It's not the risk necessarily of never getting your data back. It's the length of time in which that takes. Backups are great, but they're only as good in the speed in which you can recover. Go and look at the pipeline. What was the real impact of that pipeline attack? It wasn't the idea that they were never going to get their systems up online or, or that they weren't going to get their data back. It was the length of time that it took. And it was over a week that they didn't have access. I, we still pay three thirty dollars a gallon up here in Connecticut. That's directly uh, attached to that attack. So again, the ripple effects of this are not necessarily, hey, I'm never going to get my data back. It's the length of time. And they, don't forget, they paid the ransom and they were still down for a week. That's really what we're looking at. And I can remember reporting on the findings of this report back in 2018. And the number, the average number uh, that we saw in payments of a ransomware attack on a small business was only $4,300, right? Not enough to break the bank. The average impact to a small business was 10 times higher, $46,000, right? Jumps off the screen at you. Look at where these numbers have gone. Right now in North America, the average ransomware attack costs a small business about $300,000. Now, I did a uh, a panel recently with a gentleman from the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Their number is actually 1.6 million. Um, regardless of, of where you're at, these are the numbers we're talking about, six or seven figures. And on that panel, he also said that the average length of downtime, the average uh, length of time it takes a business to get fully back up and running after a ransomware attack is 16.2 days. So everybody listening to this webinar right now, um, you know, everybody's different. So there's one man nonprofits all the way up to you know 200 seat law firms. It's all scalable, but this is the math they want you to do. If you're highly transactional, that number creeps up into the seven figures very, very quickly. So start to just think about what it would look like if you were down for 16 days. How many folks can survive that? And the scariest stat when in all of this is that when we talk to business owners, only about 30% were very concerned about ransomware, despite the fact that we saw an uptick last year. Despite the fact that it's a multi-billion dollar a year industry, seven in 10 business owners weren't doing anything different in 2021. That means for the criminals, 2021 is going to be a great year. Wait till we see the numbers uh, when the FBI starts reporting the numbers from uh, ransomware attacks towards the beginning of next year. They're going to be staggering. We've continued to see an uptick, and that's because this number is not changing. As a matter of fact, the, the number in 2019 was 41%. It's going in the wrong direction. I kind of take a little personal offense to that because this is all I do is go around doing these educational webinars and maybe we need to change our messaging because this is the scary number here, that 30% number. We need to make this go up uh, because if you're not putting systems in place or more importantly, just taking it seriously, then they know they're going to be successful because it's like anything else. They're going to go to the, the path of least resistance. And so they know this number, they're going to send out all these attacks knowing they're going to get a lot of low hanging fruit with very little effort to get in. And if you could show them that not only do you have protections on the front end, but if you are attacked, you don't have to pay the ransom because you're resilient, they're gonna move on to the next victim, right? It's a volume-based attack system that they have in place. And so the real question when you're looking at cyber resiliency is two different things. The, we could acronym me to death, but the two important ones here are your recovery point objective, the star on the left and the recovery time objective, the star on the right. So disaster strikes. It could be a hurricane. It could be a hardware failure, whatever happens. The left-hand side of the screen really looks at, okay, well, how much data am I at risk of losing? That's sim simply put, how often am I taking my backups? Are they daily? Okay, I'm telling myself so my RPO of a day is, is okay. And that could be fine. You could be in a business where losing a day's worth of data doesn't break the bank. Some other folks it needs to be every hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes. But you have to really answer that question. The criminals know that most businesses 
are backing up their data in some form or fashion, right? Even if it's with an antiquated tape system or something like that. So the idea there is if their only piece of leverage is that they've got your data, they, it would not be a multi-billion dollar a year industry because folks can get their data back with some you know, help from outside uh, folks like Linkai or, 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 or others. So the real question is that right-hand side of the screen. This is your recovery time objective. That's great. You're going to get your data back. How long will it take you to get that data back? Can you answer that question? And is it aggressive enough for you? Would it take you a day, a week, 16.2 days, longer? Uh, you need to be able to answer that question. The one takeaway from this is to go and take it, look at what you have. And most folks have never done uh, any form of true disaster test, disaster recovery plan in place that they can answer that question. But that is the critical piece here is to understand what that length of downtime so that when they come and they, they, they ask you for money, you could start doing that math in your head You say, well, I know I'll be back in eight hours, so I don't need to go pay this ransom. I'm going to be back up online. Now, when we talk about continuity of operations, this is the way we win this fight. And really what that gets into is, look, technology is, is evolving extremely fast, right? The, the cliche term in the, in the technology space is that technology accelerated 10 years in a matter of 10 months last year out of necessity, right? We all needed to be agile and work remotely, and that's all great. Now, backups have evolved as well. Despite the fact that most small businesses are still using some form of traditional file and folder backup, when you're looking at continuity of operations, you really need to have a full image of that server. And that's what this does. You're going to take a full image and you're going to capture not just the files and folders, but also the applications, the, the operating systems. Everything that lives on that server needs to live and be mirrored onto your backup. Now, in the case of Datto, I mentioned the two data centers. Um, that data would live on an on-premise device as well as subsequently those two data centers. And the reason we chose the locations of Utah and, and Pennsylvania is simple. They're on opposite sides of the country. Because if we do see you know, hurricane season starting to ramp up, we're going to see a lot of businesses that, that aren't going to have access to their systems. But you want to have multiple copies of your data with geo-redundancy. There's the, the 3 two, one model that's very critical. You want three copies of your data in, in two different locations um, with, with, with the one way to, to go and restore that data. So that's important. So when you go and look at the instant virtualization aspect, that business continuity, how resilient are you? Your first reaction, if Jim down the hallway clicks on an email from his alumni association that he's not supposed to, and he crypts his system, and now it's migrated to the systems that um, he has access to. Your first reaction now is not to be, all right, let's look at our RPO, let's start restoring that data. Your first reaction needs to be, hey, I gotta get my systems back up. I gotta service my clients. I gotta get back into production. So what that would look like is a call over to Link High, and they're gonna then spin up what's called a virtual instance of that server. So now everybody that had access to that server that's been encrypted now has access to all the tools that they need. This is going to be operating as your server. It's a true production environment, right? You're going to you're going to have access to all the applications. You could take active backups in this state. You could be in this virtual environment for a matter of hours, days, weeks, while that server is either being replaced or you know they're, they're doing some forensics on that with all the supply chain issues right now. You don't snap your fingers and get a new ser uh, server in place. And so now when that new server is in place, ready for that restoration, you're getting your business back to where you were, not when Jim clicked on the email, right? You're getting your systems back to where you were the moment that that new hardware was in place. And you can actually start that restoration while you're still in the virtualized state. So you're not closing the downtime on not only the front end and the back end as well. And so clearly the benefits here when you're looking at cyber resiliency is to reduce that downtime. Turn one of these attacks into an inconvenience as opposed to one of these business threatening events. This is critical. Um, you want to be able to answer that RTO and RPO question. We won't get into product here, but um, you know, all of these backups are, are tested, every single one of them. The offsite sync is tested. The virtualization capabilities are tested as well. So in the background, this virtualization is being spun up, brought all the way to a boot screen. There's a snapshot taken of it. So you have a timestamp of, of knowing that yes, this has been tested. If I get attacked at 7 a.m., I know I can get my systems back up online. And we're talking minutes or hours as opposed to the days or weeks or 16.2 days. And you have the ability to do this either locally or from either one of those data centers. Um, we, we, every single year, we've got thousands of businesses living out of our data centers while hurricane season takes place or fire season out in, out in the, West, um, the West Coast. So, you know, this is how we combat that. Now, I'll leave you with the idea of this kind of data migration. And again, 
we've been lucky enough to survive as, as, as much as possible during the last 15, 18 months because we've been able to work remotely. And there's been, there's tools out there where you can be agile. Nobody picks up the phone and calls my cell phone anymore. They, they send me a Teams invite or a Zoom invite, right? That's how we're meeting. That's how we're collaborating. That's how we're, we're handling conferences. That's how we're doing webinars like this. I used to go out and do a lot of lunch and learns or, or live presentations. Those are starting to open up, but I'm doing hundreds of these webinars now because that's the way we communicate. And although we're getting back to some form of normalcy, this type of collaboration and this, this type of doing business, this is here to stay. Business is made investments. We're all used to doing this now. I can't imagine that that's all going to go away. We're still going to be having team meetings. We're still going to be having uh, you know, the, the collaboration tools happening in those data centers. Now, we saw the big uptick, and you can go and look at some of the stats of where Microsoft 365 went. Um, but it's important to note that those systems are vulnerable as well within that ransom report quarter of those managed service providers that we talked to had clients who were attacked. Majority of those were on Microsoft 365, although we saw them in, in Google Workspace and, and Dropbox and a lot of others. So it's important to note that, yeah, Microsoft's cloud is, is very strong. There's not a lot of brute force attacks even being attempted on Microsoft's cloud. But if somebody within your organization opens the door and lets them in, well, there's not much you can do. And again, you can just start Googling it now and look up Microsoft 365 email attacks, and they're, they're very prevalent. And again, most of the time, it's due to human error. Not, not necessarily maliciously, but inadvertently, opening the door to letting these folks in. And when you look at your user agreement with Microsoft or Google, they both have what's called the shared responsibility model, which essentially means that they're gonna protect the integrity of their cloud, right? They, they, they're gonna um, guarantee that. But the data that lives within it, that's your responsibility. And I've done presentations up in their Burlington, Massachusetts headquarters and sat on panels with their you know, cloud engineers. And they will openly talk about the responsibility that you have as a tenant um, to protect your data. And that's right in all of their agreements. You can go to their uh, forums and they're going to talk about their liability for the deletion of data, whether it is just a deletion that then has been gone for 30 days and, and is expunged from the the junk box, or it is somebody opening the door and letting them in. Google has essentially the same language, right? Um, I'll, I, you can, another little homework assignment before we wrap up, there's a gentleman, very interesting story, a gentleman by the name of Kevin Mitnick. You might've heard of him back in the nineties. He was actually on the FBI's most wanted list. Um, he was caught with very high profile arrest. He was uh, sent to jail. He came out. Now he's what's called an ethical hacker. He's one of the good guys, right? Kind of the uh, catch me if you can type story. And we actually hired him to come out to our large annual DattoCon conference back in 2019. And he showed a live virus that he created. And he called it Ransom Cloud because he saw where the direction of these criminals were going to be going in. And this was a live virus. This was not a click through theoretical. He said, if I was still a bad guy, this is what I'd be doing today in 2019. And what this looked like, he stood on stage with two laptops and it took him all of three minutes to do this demonstration. He said, OK, look. This email comes in, it looks legitimate. For, it's got all the logos on it. it. looks like it's coming from Microsoft. Got to update your anti-spam pro Sit through a webinar like this, cyber resiliency, I got to be safe. You know, you, you get this email in your inbox first thing in the morning, let me do this before my meetings start. And so all you got to do, again, looks pretty legitimate here, click accept. Now every single email in your inbox has been encrypted and you've got admin access, you run the risk of that entire domain being impacted. And that goes back to, that's the idea of a real culture of security. You want to make sure that all of your, your employees have access to all the tools that they need. But more importantly, you need to make sure they only have access to the systems that they need. You go back to looking at some of those uh, malicious attacks. A lot of times these folks are granted access to systems that they didn't need to be, uh, they didn't need to have access to. And so go back and do some, you know, uh, an inventory of where all your physical devices live. Um, where all that critical data lives, whether it's in a, a SaaS application like Microsoft 365, right? Software as a service application, whether it is on a physical piece of hardware, whether it's on a, an endpoint. Make sure that that data is all protected, it's all backed up, but also make sure that everybody only has access to the systems that they need. You'd be very surprised how easy it is for folks just to say, let's just give everybody admin access. It's just easier. I don't know who's going to need access to it. So everybody's got admin access. Criminals love that. And so it's extremely critical to understand that wherever that data lives, it runs the risk of being impacted. And you're going to see that scary red screen from Mr. Mitnick that says, hey, pay me money. And there it is in Bitcoin. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get all those emails back to you.
very important to do that. So, I mean, next steps, again, I can't emphasize enough the need to understand your recovery time objective and how quickly you can get your systems back up online. Those are the folks that don't pay the ransom. Those are the folks that say, okay, let me just get my employees access to everything they need. Uh, for the most part of that's happening locally, the employees won't even know the attack occurred. They're just up and running access to all, everything that they need to be productive and they're on their way. Give Link High Technologies a call, let them come in, do a, an assessment of what you have. Um, maybe you're completely protected, that's great, but it's very important to get a second set of eyes of experts in there to take a look at what you have and ensure that you're protected. So we recorded this, so if you do want a copy of the recording and share it with the, the rest of the folks in your office, please feel free to do so. Uh, everybody, stay safe and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.